Thank you. I didn't realise that I had to compete with Star Wars out in the hall, so uh, if you have any trouble hearing me, please let me know. And as for the critics down the back row, uh, you know, if I, if I get it wrong or something like that, just hold it off until the end of the session, okay? <laughs> I've got one objective from this session, and that is that I want everyone in this room to walk out of the room at the end of the session equipped to have a conversation with your manager or your customer on Monday about why they should be doing data warehousing on PostgreSQL. If you go out of here with four ideas on why it's a great thing to do, then I've achieved what I wanted from the session. Something I've noticed is that it's traditional at these events to say a little bit of something about yourself. Well, that's me. <laughs> More to the point, that was me three years ago. And that's because three years ago, I ran Microsoft's big data operation across the whole of Asia. So I was out there selling SQL Server and selling MPP SQL Server right across Asia to the sorts of customers that you're working with now. But I like this little quote, there's no zealot more fervent than a reformed sinner. Well that's me, I'm reformed. And let me tell you why, whilst I was working with Microsoft, we kept coming up against this company called Green Club. And if there's a god out there, it is the god that gave Green Plum to EMC, because on that day, Green Plum stopped kicking our butt and for some reason turned their focus inwards. Because in every POC, in every sales opportunity, they were beating us. And when I looked into the reasons that they were beating us, I kept seeing this name, PostgreSQL, coming up over and over again. And at the same time, I was meeting with customer after customer across Asia where the volumes of data that they were dealing with, the architectures of data that they were dealing with, SQL Server was becoming too expensive for those customers. Instead of being a tool that helped them cut the cost of Oracle, it was actually a tax on getting the work done in developing economies. And as I started looking at this, one day I just woke up like Paul on the road to Damascus and had this vision that said, there's got to be a better way. And that was the day that I decided I was moving on from Microsoft and I was going to take a very, very hard look at this product called PostgreSQL. And eventually, having done that, we started a business called Agilius, which is in the business of data warehouse automation. So. Who in this room has worked with a data warehouse? Okay, that's only about the third of you, maybe a quarter, and that's what I expected. So let me do a little bit of a scene setter that says why data warehouses are important. The first thing, that big rock is Oracle. <laughs> that little person is the PostgreSQL guy. When you are trying to switch people off Oracle to PostgreSQL, you are Sisyphus pushing that massive great rock uphill and at the end of every night it rolls down to the bottom and you start again and you push the rock back up. And do you know why that is? That's because of this horrible word called applications. To switch a database from Oracle to PostgreSQL usually means rewriting applications. And that's hard because application developers have gone to a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, effort to make Oracle work properly in their applications and application vendors have certified their product on Oracle. So even if you convince a customer to switch, you still have to go through the problem of ISV certification which is where you want SAP or PeopleSoft or whoever it might be to say we will certify and support that application that you used to run on Oracle now that you put it on PostgreSQL. I've got as much chance of walking out the door, buying a 4D ticket and retiring rich on Monday than I have of the average ISV doing that, okay? But there is a better way. And that way is peace and serenity and business intelligence. Why is business intelligence and data warehousing a great candidate to move? Because it doesn't have applications. You haven't written barriers of transaction processing applications, you haven't written multi-processing, you haven't written screens and forms and reports and business logic and all of that type of thing that sits on top of your database. What you have is a product like Click or Power BI or Tableau 
or business objects or even Excel that runs on its own and connects to a database. So all of a sudden, your problem shifts from one of porting a database and a massive application to one of porting a database. And that's a much easier problem to deal with. Data warehousing and business intelligence is where the next 100,000 corporate users of PostgreSQL are going to come from. Think about that as I talk through the rest of this session. Why do you need a data warehouse? Well, the first foot reason. You need a data warehouse if you want to integrate information from multiple systems. So if you want to take information from your ERP system, your HR system, your general ledger system, pull it all together and make it available for unified reporting, that's a use case for a data warehouse. The second one is where you want to integrate internal and external data. Now, people often start to talk about sentiment analysis and things like that. That's rubbish. Okay? Even if you get sentiment analysis, most of the people in this room work for customers where they might see one tweet per week if they're lucky. And you can't do sentiment analysis off the back of that. If you're NTUC, maybe you can. If you're Sintel, maybe you can. But most of us don't work for organisations like that. When I talk about internal and external data, what I'm really talking about is customers and suppliers. If you need to interchange data with people, if you want to bring in information about forward order loads or whatever it might be, and to integrate that with information from your organisation, that's another use case for a data warehouse. But then we get into the two most common reasons. And the first of those is to make sure that we're talking about one version of the truth. How many times have you seen in a system, in an organisation, that in one system your user ID is Ron D, in another system you have the ID 823456, and in another system you're known as Ronald James Dunn, and in another system you're known as Fred because the person who did the data entry couldn't figure out how you said your name and they just made it up. <laughs> Happens a lot, right? So this is why we use a data warehouse, so that we can bring together and cleanse all of that data from all of those different systems and package it up so that regardless of what the source system calls me, when I do reporting, I'm known as the one entity, Ron Dunn. The last one is a little bit harder to grasp, and this is about analysing data in historical context. Who did you work for five years ago? Five years ago? Yep. And Pajit. Who do you work for now? Pajit, sir. Two different companies, right? This is historical change in data. So if I wanted to count the number of employees that worked for Fujitsu, right now, for example, I would do a count across my database and I would get a number. But that's not necessarily true if I wanted to know how many people worked for companies five years ago. And this is where we need to keep the history of data over time, such that I know not only your current employer, but who you used to work for. And where it comes up in organisations is restructures. So we shifted a product from one category to another last year. Well, we restructured our organisation, and now China reports into GCR rather than APAC. Okay? If we need to be able to compare data at rolled up levels at different points in time, we need slowly changing dimensions in a data warehouse in order to have that historical context. So we need a data warehouse. And the other thing that's changed in the industry, sorry. Okay, um, the other thing that's changed in the industry is the traditional BI architecture. Ten years ago, when you went out and bought Hyperion or Business Objects or Epic or a product of that type, you bought a product that talked directly to a database. And sometimes you might find that you needed a little bit more performance for aggregated queries, so you put another product in here which was an OLAP server, such as SQL Server Analysis Services, for example. But in each case, whenever I ran a query in the front-end tool, that query was executed against a back-end data source. That's 10-year-old architecture. The current architecture looks like this, where Click or Tableau or Power BI each have their own embedded data engine sitting within those products. 
and in fact, as a small point of interest, both Click and Tableau use PostgreSQL as their embedded data engine. Now, what happens in these products is periodically, and it might be once per day or once per hour or once per minute, you refresh that product cache from the back-end database. Your interactions then work with that product's cache. Why is this important? Because it means that databases that might not necessarily have the very highest scale or the very highest performance are now more than adequate to deliver business intelligence, analytics, and visualizations. So all of a sudden, you should be having the lights start to come on that say, OK, where once someone told me that I needed to have a teradata in order to process an extremely large volume of data fast enough for business intelligence, now that I have these caching products, maybe I can go back a step and PostgreSQL isn't such a bad product after all when it comes to the data warehouse. And that's what I want to talk about now. I want to talk about four common problems in data warehousing and what it is that PostgreSQL does really, really well to make it a great platform for a data warehouse. Now I'm going to illustrate that with a couple of little photographs from around Singapore. Three years ago, I was living in Singapore and for those of you who aren't from here, if you were fortunate enough to be here in August, you would walk around the streets to the smell of burning. And it's a festival that's called Hungry Ghost. It's a bit like the European festival, um, the Night of the Dead, for example, where uh, people come back to visit. And you'll see burning happening in the street. And people will be burning replicas of cars or houses or simply money or offering food or whatever to make the people who have come back more comfortable. I have a three-year-old son. Well, he was three-year-old then. He was six now. He watched the people doing this, and it must have sunk into his head in some way, because one night we were sitting at Dunman Road Hawker Centre eating our dinner, and he wanders off, um, and as he wanders off, we heard a lady say, no, 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 and we looked up, and he'd taken his mother's coin purse, and he'd thrown it into the fire. So um, that's, that's what you call throwing away money. <laughs> and that's the key to the first of these stories, which is about the cost of data warehousing. I'd like to show you two graphs. This is an on-premise graph. This represents the comparative cost of running SQL Server versus PostgreSQL. Now, when I say on-premise, this is the licensing cost alone for an eight-core server. So when you think about it, the typical environment is going to run an always-on scenario, for example. So it's going to run two actives, so you can double those prices. Um, but you know, we're looking at Enterprise Edition, which is what Microsoft will recommend for a data warehouse workload, 55,000 US. We're looking at Standard Edition. Well, if you were looking at, say, a terabyte, you might be talked to about Standard Edition being satisfactory, $14,000. PostgreSQL, zero. No brainer so far, right? Big savings to be made there. But what that's ignoring is the cost of associated hardware and so on that's necessary to run on your platform. Now, you're possibly wondering why aren't I showing Oracle in there? Um, no point. Oracle's lost the market as far as on-premise data warehousing goes. That's why they're making such a big push for cloud at the moment. Where across Asia, most companies that you need to look at as targets for data warehousing migrations are sitting on this platform. And there are hundreds of thousands of them sitting across Asia at the moment. So let's move to the next one, which is a cloud base. Because if we go to AWS, RDS actually gives me a great basis for comparison on using PostgreSQL, including hardware. So what I did here was I looked at a dbr 3 2x large, which is an eight core processor, 64 gig of memory, roughly the equivalent to the machine that I sized here. And if I do that for enterprise edition on a three year all paid up front, which is the cheapest way that you can buy it, the three year cost is just on $100,000. If I did it on standard edition, $48,000, if I did it on PostgreSQL, $9,000. So that's everything to run your data warehouse in the cloud at that point on PostgreSQL. 
So all of a sudden, the economics really start to look good here. And this is takeaway number one that I wanted you to have for your conversation on Monday morning. When you talk to your boss or to your customer, Mr. Customer, wouldn't you like it if I could cut $100,000 from your IT budget next year? Pretty good argument for a little bit of services work that's going to be necessary to shift that data warehouse. The next picture. My second favourite airline. My favourite airline is Asiana out of Korea, but Singapore Airlines um, has for a long time uh, been probably the world's best airline. But um, this is a picture of their A380 when it first came into production and deployment here in Singapore. The A380, for those of you who haven't flown in one, brings with it one significant problem and to put it in database terms, it's ingestion. Gates at an airport are the things that these things hang off, right? Gates are on slots. A slot is where you park your aeroplane. Slots are very, 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 very expensive. The longer you have a plane sitting there, the more you get charged. Now, this is a problem for an A380 because an A380 carries a very large number of people. And to get all of those people onto a plane as quickly as possible, they needed to come up with a new gating system in order to direct the people into the various areas of the plane, get them on and off quickly so that they could keep the slots turning over and not have to pay a fortune for parking an A380 at an airport. And this brings me to the next part of the problem, which is loading. Loading is how we get data into a data warehouse. And you'll typically hear it called one of two three-letter acronyms, one, two, three. Um, the acronyms being ELT or ETL. Most of you have probably heard ETL. That stands for Extract, Transform and Load. And it says that I extract data from my source system, I do some messing around with it, and when I'm happy with its shape, I put it into my data warehouse. ELT stands for Extract, Load and Transform. This works really, really well with bigger volumes of data because you get your data out of your source system, you load it into your data warehouse, and then you mess around and clean it up using the power of the data warehouse engine. So ELT is a better, let's call it a V2 of ETL. It's a better approach to the process of getting data from point A to point B, where point B is your data warehouse. So I'm going to demonstrate what is nice about PostgreSQL when it comes to loading data into an application. And uh, Samir mentioned that I was going to show something about our product. I'm not really, okay? I am going to show a part of our product now, but I'll talk to anyone later. This is about PostgreSQL, not about Agilius. So you'll see something in the user interface. I'm not going to explain everything that's there. But basically, um, our application has an interface that looks like this. And when we're ingesting data into our system from third-party databases, repositories, whatever it might be, I've defined some metadata. And on disk, I have a very simple metadata equivalent, um, which is a table that's coming from a Microsoft retail inventory data set. You'll see more about this in a moment, but in our application, you click here and you say, show me the scripts, and we've generated a bunch of DDL and a bunch of Python scripts that handle all of the ELT process. So I'm going to create that table in my database. And while that's happening, it just takes a couple of seconds because I haven't hit the database in a while. So let me scroll down, and right here is the important part of this line. And unfortunately, my screen's a little bit condensed here, um, but it's basically this statement. Now, is there anyone in the room who has worked on the copy feature of PostgreSQL from the PostgreSQL contributors? You? Can I kiss you afterwards, please? Uh, you asking about your work on or work with? On. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, see, so now he backs down. Now he backs down. Okay. <laughs> I would love. You should have offered just. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would love to hug the person who invented copy because copy is a, one of the great competitive weapons of PostgreSQL that's been picked up by other databases in the meantime. 
There are two reasons for that. One, it's very flexible with the types of data that it can ingest. But number two, for this little word here, which says STDIN, the ability to stream data from another process that may be on another machine is just a fantastic benefit when it comes to simplifying ELT within PostgreSQL. Let me give you an example here. I'm going to click this load button and it's going to execute that script. So it's just waiting for a couple of seconds. It'll take about 18, 19 seconds, this particular one to run. But what I'd like you to look at is down here where it says script success, just above where it says waiting for local host, in about three, two, one, <laughs> half. <laughs> okay, now that was a little bit slower than usual. Um, not 100% sure why, but let's look at this number here. 8,013,099 rows in 22 seconds. Now that normally runs in 18 and a half seconds on this machine, which equates to 450,000 rows per second. That is a great volume of data to stream into your data warehouse. Let me put this 8 million rows in context. 8 million is the number of passengers that pass through Changi Airport in four months. So if we kept every passenger record that came from there, we would put that into PostgreSQL in around 20 seconds. 8 million is the number of passenger vehicles, passenger, not commercial, that Toyota built in 2014. We could take the vehicle record of every car that Toyota built and put it into PostgreSQL in less than 20 seconds. This is huge. We have a data warehouse customer in Italy who's a company called D Squared 2. D Squared 2 is a, a high-end fashion label for young women around the ages of 19 to 24, somewhere around about there. Not exactly my demographic, put it that way. They have an interesting scenario because they're a collection-based fashion house. That means they don't have products that run for a year. Their product line is one. They might have one dress of a particular type. They might have five pairs of shoes of a particular type. When they go through their ERP process and they're building out their planning data warehouse, they're rebuilding the data warehouse completely every hour. And this is for a global business. So from go to woe, every hour, they do a rebuild. It takes them five minutes. So they're always working with absolute current data where everything could change within their data warehouse. This is probably, lay down, hands down, the best feature of PostgreSQL when it comes to data warehousing. The performance of copy is just fantastic. So let's go back to the presentation uh, because there's one other thing that I'd like to talk about. That's what people talk about ingesting data. Everyone says to me, why don't you use FDW, foreign data wrappers? Well, they're okay, but it's a balancing act, right? And for me, the balance is on the copy side rather than the FDW side. FDWs are great in two scenarios. One is where you want a federated database arrangement, where you want to be able to, within a transaction, and I mean a business transaction, not a database transaction, within one transaction, perhaps get a piece of information from this system, bring it into your application, update it, and then send it back again. They're great for that type of operation. They're great for casual use, where you want to bring some data temporarily into a PostgreSQL database. But they have some pretty severe limitations at the moment. They've got limitations around authentication. They're not as fast as a copy statement. Um, if you're running to run across a network, we can't compress. We've got a slower method of network transmission that has to happen there. So FDWs, in my mind, are not quite there yet as an ingestion method. Our testing shown that copying is still a far better solution in our application. When FDWs do get there, um, then we might rethink that decision. But right now, on balance, look at copy rather than FDW when it comes to ETL and ELT. Okay, one more thing that I really, really like in the product. And here I'm going to switch to a database editor. And this is something called block range index. Now, I spoke earlier about our database comprising facts and dimensions. Facts are the numbers that we want to look at. Dimensions are how we slice and dice them, right? So if I have a fact that is a sale, 
it occurred on a date, well that's a dimension, I bought a product, that's another dimension, and I bought it in a particular store, that's another dimension, right? And one of the challenges in data warehousing is when you've loaded your dimensions, so you've loaded every one of the million, million products that you had and the changes that happened to them that day, you then want to be able to access them very quickly when you do joins to your fact table. So indexing of dimensions is important. But if you're dealing with very large dimensions, such as every customer of DBS Bank or every subscriber to Singtel, having an index on those tables is going to slow down your ETL process because you have to update the index at the same time as you do your data ingestion. So the typical approach in data warehousing is to drop your indexes, update your dimension, and then re-index your tables. Let me give you an example of that. I'm going to create a little dummy here, um, and I'm going to do that as a select from that table we just loaded. So I'm creating a table called Brin Test, and we'll execute that. And this will take six to eight seconds to run. Hopefully it didn't take 10 like it did last time, just a little bit slower. Okay, 8.9 seconds. All right, we're running a little bit slower today for some reason. Um, and now what I'm going to do is account so that we can see how many rows are in that particular table. Please, dear God, top of the list, will someone fix PostgreSQL count star? It is hands down the one head shaker when everyone from another database looks at PostgreSQL. They say, why is it so damn slow to, okay, I've read the blogs, I've read the wiki, I know the explanations, but just fix it. Just make it, make it appear to go fast, even if it's not 100% accurate, just fix it. Um, so we've got 8 million and a few rows there, which is what we had before. So now um, I'm going to create, I'm going to re-index my business key column in that table. Well, I'm not really, and the reason for that is time, because it would take three to four minutes of silence in order to run that particular query, which is create index, B-tree index in this case, um, on that particular table, right? And it would fire away and eventually I'd have an index sitting there. Not great, because this is showing that a large proportion of my ETL time is going to an index rebuild. So some clever person came up with something called this block range index. And what it does is it looks at every page in the database. And for the index column, it stores what is the minimum value and the maximum value on that page. So it means that rather than inspecting every row that's on that page and saying, do I need this particular row or not? It can now say, um, okay, I'm just going to go through here and I don't even need to look at that page if I'm outside the range that's there. So you can throw away a huge amount of the data that you previously had to look at when you were using an index. So let's take a look at what that means and we'll run that. And that's only going to take maybe 15 seconds and we've indexed our entire table. Now this is a huge saving in ETL batches. If you're looking at an overnight batch window where all of your processing has to be completed before 6 a.m. so that the people who come in early in the morning can do work on your data warehouse, every second that you save in your ETL processing is important. And here, in 12 seconds versus 4 minutes, which it was previously, we've re-indexed that table. But even better, there's another benefit that comes from it. And that's if I come here and run this query. I'm taking a look at some of the details of the objects that I've created there. Ah, uh, oh, darn, I didn't create the other one. Okay, uh, what's interesting is that the table itself is 713 megabytes. If I'd run that query that created the B-tree index, it would have been about 800k. In this case, we've got 40k in the Brin index. Now that's going to sit very nicely in memory without taking up too much space. It's a high performance index. Um, this is a really, really good strategy for star schema data warehouses and the joins that might come out of those. So another feature that I really love about PostgreSQL. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay, here's another photo of Singapore. Singapore, for those of you who are visitors, you might have used the train, that's Singapore MRT, SMRT. SMRT for many years was the best train system hands down across Asia. 
in the last two or three years, particularly the last two, SMRT has been having some reliability problems. And this is a photograph from last year of an outage where trains between Bishan and Yishun were out of service. Now, this is all being remediated at the moment, but the reason that this came about was one thing. There had not been enough maintenance done on SMRT over that long period when it was the premier train service in Asia. It'll come back. It's being worked on right now. It'll be back as the best. But things go wrong when you don't do maintenance or you don't allow for maintenance within your environment. My daughter looked at me putting this presentation together and she said, Dad, don't use a selfie. <laughs> OK, it's not me. It's not me. <laughs> promise, I promise. I, I don't have a shirt like that. Um, but what, uh, what this does show is that sometimes we can burst our limits. OK? And the next demonstration that I want to do is about a feature that I think is an unsung little hero in PostgreSQL, and I call this one preventing data bloat. So let me go back to that editor that I was using just a moment ago. Um, I want to come down to here, and I want to create a test table. And this table is going to have three columns. It's going to have a name, a currency, and an amount. It doesn't mean anything. They're just a text field, a character field, and a number. OK, so I'm going to create that particular table and then I'm going to put some data into it and I'm going to show you what those rows are. OK, we've put some values in there. We've got run done, Australia, $100, Keegan Chu from Singapore, $9,000. OK, what often happens, the number one reason the data warehouses break is because the designer of the data warehouse declared their column, like I've got up the top there, varchar 30, or had a numeric field that they declared as, say, decimal 10, 2. <coughs> and as a result of business growth or some other change in the environment, you've got a wraparound. Let's take a look at some classic examples. <laughs> this is a real name. This is a gentleman who was pivotal in India in the fight against British colonialism. Um, let's just try and run this one and we see this horrible error, value too long for character type varying. That's a bit of a problem. Um, here's another one. We have, um, this is my wife in fact, who's from Hanoi and we're going to put in $10,000 US which is like $22 billion or Vietnam Dong, right? So if we insert that into our database, whoops, we've overflowed that particular number. Or third, perhaps even worse, is um, I want to put in a rate associated with my dear friend Herman Tan from Jakarta, and I want to put in a value here which is 1234567891 because any rates to do with Indonesian rupiah, you need to go out to four or six decimal places. And in this case, well, that worked, but looks what happened here when I do that select. Okay, we've got 0.79 because that was a comma two field. Now, each of those is a problem for maintenance in the data warehouse. This last one's probably the worst because you've lost significant data and you didn't know it. This is where PostgreSQL has one absolutely insanely beautiful feature. But I would wash the feet of the person who did this one. <laughs> that's, that's how good it is. And this is this anonymous data type which says that I can say text or numeric, and it doesn't care what goes into it in that case. So let me recreate that table. The amount of work that this has saved me in growing people's data warehouses, you would just not believe. I can sleep at night because I know I'm not going to get a numeric overflow in someone's database thanks to this feature. OK, let's put some of that data back in this case. We'll take these three rows here, we'll put them into the table, and then I'll run that query again. And what you see here is that it worked. OK, look over here. We've got zero decimals, two decimals, four decimals. It is storing the value that it got from the underlying data store. Now, this is just a feature that is of immeasurable value when you're doing business intelligence and data warehousing. This is the third one that I want you to think about for your customers. OK, let's go back to the presentation. A couple of minutes to go. Yep? Uh, I find that you 
usual reason for fixing a limit is uh, that uh, you'll be able to query the system a bit more optimized way. If you put text in memory, we are open fields, then uh, I'm sure it's something to do with the way data is stored, then you know that after 30 characters in the first case, yes. it will be the next one. And here you don't know how long, so yep. you do extra calculation. Yep. Leave it to the database to figure that out. Don't put that, okay. In a transaction processing system, um, thinking back to something that CK talked about this morning, in a transaction processing system, your job is to get one record as quickly as possible and write one record as quickly as possible. Some elements of performance might be true. In a data warehouse, don't care. I'm doing, yep? It doesn't matter. We're not gonna optimize the character. We're gonna store all the number of characters you give us and we're still gonna go hop to the next bag. It doesn't, I mean, don't know the things that they Right, yeah, so even better. Car, tech, car, car, and text behave exactly the same. It's, yeah, it's not like SQL service text where it's not an indexable primary key column. Text just works in the database. It's fine. Jim, okay. Uh, a follow-up question. Uh, do you think if, if you're using text or if you're using data without the limit, it creates a flow, it, it ends up creating a close table for that? Will that cause a problem for me? No, because you're never going to access yeah. it. The toast chip was it is like eight k just sits there. So if you never use a long column, it never. You're right. It will create a toast table, but there's no. If you have proper control on your application side, it works. If you mm, not have checks, that you do not put four gigabytes to yeah. the text. Yeah. Yeah. So for the common business problem, which is that someone changed a field in a source system or something like that, this is a great solution. Okay, next one. Singapore's nearest neighbour is Malaysia. And the way that you get to Malaysia is through something called the checkpoint. The checkpoint is the funnel of death, particularly <laughs> on the eve of Hari Raya, which is when this particular photograph was taken, when every Malaysian with a motorbike or a car wants to get back home for family reunion and celebrations, etc and it can take hours and hours and hours to get from Singapore to Malaysia or back again. And this brings me to the third part of the conversation, which is scale. And the reason I call it scale is one of the reasons that this doesn't work is it funnels into a little bottleneck and they just don't have enough counters or gates to handle the number of people that are coming through the borders at that particular time of year. So what happens in your database when you don't have enough scale capacity? These three things are things that are really, really easy as a result of a decision to use PostgreSQL. And these three databases, Redshift, PostgreSQL, uh, Greenplum, Vitesse, we've heard more about today, in particular Deep Green as its variant, these are so easy to move from PostgreSQL to one of these platforms that it's just a breeze. I'd like to do one more little demonstration though, um, which is from our product, because we build data warehouses through metadata, and as I showed you before, we capture information about what it is that you want in the data warehouse, so you tell us in a declarative manner, but we have a little feature here that says, if you built your data warehouse on PostgreSQL, you can do something called migrate and you can pick another one here which in this case we'll say is redshift for example and we'll call it um, PG Day Asia is that particular data warehouse and we'll call that one Chinook uh, PG Day okay and we'll migrate it and that's now rewritten all of the ETL code and the migration jobs to pick up your data warehouse that was on PostgreSQL and migrate the entire thing to Redshift and have it up and running in five minutes once you've uh, migrated all of your data. Don't believe me? Let's take a look at that. We'll go and look at the load scripts in that particular case, uh, list the load tables, and if we have a look at that inventory job that we did just a little while ago, um, is that a good example? No. A better example would be in a dimension and here we'll look at the scripts and see that in this case we're generating distribution and sort keys for Redshift because we have that knowledge about what the application should look like. So migration is yet another great reason to be using PostgreSQL for your data warehouse because you have a step ahead of you no matter how big it is that you grow within an organisation. 
it is not a lock-in you're completely open on where you can go once you've built your data warehouse that way okay um, I was a little bit ahead of myself I went and did that demonstration one slide early let me come back let me do a bit of a wrap-up the end of the day um, this is one of my favorite places in Singapore this is somewhere called Pulau Ubin Pulau Ubin is an island just off the coast of Singapore until last year I think they've gone now um, last year they were starting to close down the last of the villages that actually lived on that island um, but it's a beautiful spot a great spot to go for relaxation if you've got some time free and it gives me some pleasant thoughts when I look at um, Pulau Ubin and when we start to wrap up a discussion of PostgreSQL data warehousing these are the four things that I wanted to equip you with for your conversation on Monday so that you can go to your boss or to your customer and say here are four things that we should be talking about on why we should be putting our data warehouse on PostgreSQL the first one's value you are going to save at least one hundred thousand dollars by putting your database on PostgreSQL rather than SQL Server I've shown you the maths you can show him the same thing second one performance you have better performance than loading in a SQL Server environment um, if I'd had a bit more time I might have done a comparative test but I wasn't set up for it today uh, 450,000 rows a second is nothing to be sneezed at and you could take all of your company's data and ingest it in a very short space of time third one maintenance those f context free data types are just fantastic for avoiding the most common problem that comes up in data warehousing management which means that the callbacks etc that you might get as a result of having your data warehouse on a platform are minimized and the last one the one that I really like is scale and freedom no matter how big you get your PostgreSQL data warehouse has a path to another destination it's not a massive rewrite it's not a radical oh my gosh where do we go let's start again and we're completely incompatible it's a step away from some of the biggest platforms that are out there and having the freedom to choose is what I really like about this platform and about what I've been hearing over the last couple of days let's go back to that little view of Pula Ubin call to action this is the last slide that I've got this is what I want you to do I want you to go and talk to a SQL Server customer this week about slashing the cost of data warehousing and BI if they'd like to do that and if you'd like to talk to us about how we can make it even faster to get their data warehouse up and running by all means feel free to contact me um, but in the interest of your customers go and do this thank you everybody for your time today okay we've got time for a couple of questions yes so uh, one of you already uh, in the first few slides indicated competitive costs. Yes. And uh, the enterprise edition, I think, just the software, the licensing went up to somewhere around fifty-eight thousand dollars per year. And we get a list of post versus zero. Uh, would I be correct to assume that that fifty-eight thousand dollars actually includes support costs? Well? No, no. Uh, Microsoft licenses on the basis of what they call L and SA. L is the licensing cost. That so-called support cost, Microsoft calls software assurance and it has another couple of things in it that was L only pricing that I put there okay, now it up. was list pricing uh, most customers will be on most big customers are on something called an enterprise agreement that will have tiered discounting depending on where they are but for mid-sized customers that's how much they're paying you, you haven't added the price of uh, Windows NT yet no I haven't that's <laughs> just the database licensing <laughs> any other yes so let's say if I have a Huge amount of data to store, and that's why the storage cost is quite important. Yes. So in this case, is it better to keep in a Postgres database, or I just feel like as a compressed CSV, Whoa. assuming that I don't really need to access it? That okay, uh, that's a tough use case. Um, if it is structured data, put it in the warehouse because the cost of storage is getting cheaper and cheaper. If your major problem is the cost of storage, think about moving it to Redshift, a thousand dollars per petabyte per year on three year storage for slow processing uh, but I think you're probably going to be more satisfied what's a huge volume of data for you let's see above 10 to see 10 terabytes ah oh, nothing don't worry about it um, no need to change I heard an example today of a hundred plus terabyte warehouse from someone who was speaking earlier I forget who it was um, at one of our test data warehouses is five terabytes uh, just don't worry about it uh, that's a that's a nice number 
to run on a PostgreSQL data warehouse. Yes, please. A lot of us have been working with Postgres for a long time, and it's just refreshing to see somebody coming brand new and sort of see a lot of the benefits that I think we kind of get used to and we don't think about because we just kind of live and breathe it. But you come here from the outside, it, it, it's it's a fresh, it's a breath of fresh air, and you, you point out things that we don't appreciate. I think a lot of times take it for granted. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, but uh, look, it's a great product to be involved with. It's a great community. I've really enjoyed, uh, I, I'm really pleased that I made the decision to come to PG Day and to meet a lot of you. Um, and I think this is one of the strengths that the product has going forward. So fantastic. Well done. Any other questions? One last question, perhaps? No? I'll hand it over to you for the break. <laughs>